going to talk about some modified sports, so I'm going to teach you some more secrets of the activity director and skills. What happens is that we have to we have to have exercise group, but exercise group gets really boring, and we have a hard time bringing people down to it. But when we switch it over to a game or something, a skill that we know that they can do or a skill that we can adapt for them, and I'll show you how to do some of the adaptions with a wheelchair, um, they get kind of interested and they have fun doing it. One of the things that you can do to keep exercise from getting boring, especially if you have your dementia patients, is to take cloth. These are old napkins that we're going to be thrown out. And what I do is I give everybody a section of it. So it goes all the way around the circle. So people on the other side where you are sitting can see what I'm doing. And what we will do is this will be all together in a big circle. And I will say, OK, let's move our hands to the right. Let's move our hands to the left. And they now they feel the pull. So if they don't, by language, understand what to do, they are now visually seeing me do it. And they're feeling the little tug, and their hands will move. What is good about this is I'm not forcing anybody to do the exercise. If they get in pain, they will let go or drop or they won't want to do it. But the person next to them will be still hanging on. So it's a good way to make sure that I'm not hurting anybody while I'm making them or allowing them to move. So again, you go back and forth, you go up, you play peekaboo, you go down, you can roll it around. You can roll it this way, you can roll it back. Oh, that feels good, actually. And then the other thing that I like to do to keep them involved in it is I will take my part of it. This over here. I'll take my part of it and I'll say, OK, let's put it on our feet. And now we can do this, up and down. Or I can do this. Or I say, kick with your left foot. Can you get your left foot up there? And now they can kick with their left Oops. I almost lost it. I can keep with my left foot. It keeps them engaged and they don't feel like they're being forced to do it and there's going to be a lot of movement out of it. Because the most important thing for us to do is to make sure that three to five times a week we're giving them some gross motor movement. And that is a fun way to do it. When we're done with this game, I then take it and I say, okay, Boys on that side, girls on this side, and we have a tug of war. Now, what is hard for the guys is if you have more girls than you have guys, throw a couple of the other girls on the side or go help the guys because they hate to lose when they want to think how strong they are. But they really do have a good time and they brace their wheelchairs. And I have even seen when the guys think they're going to lose, they reach down and they put their brakes on. Which they're not supposed to do. That's not a good thing to do. That's not fair now, is it? So that I wanted to share with you just because it's something that people don't normally think about. The other thing that I would like to share with you is that when we play ball with people, a good thing to do is take your ball and loosen some of the air out of it. And if you'll excuse me for a minute, I'll pop up and get our ball. our regular ball right now, but what we usually do is we will take the air out of it so that they can grab it and put it against their chest and then throw it. And we find that ball and we will show we will demonstrate it for you. The other thing that I like to do when people are one-handed and can't always catch things, and I'm going to throw this over at the audience over there. Oh. You know what this oh. is? This is a rubber chicken. I just did that and everybody smiled, right? Because you don't expect to see a rubber chicken. This is a great thing to be able to catch if you're one-handed. So I'm going to throw it over there to Melissa. She'll catch it and hopefully she'll throw it back to me. So here it comes. Okay, throw it to me and I'm going to try to catch it with one hand. Now notice what happened. I had to reach forward, keep my balance, and catch it with one hand. And that very often happens if I don't have a hand that I can use. They will, when they do the modified sports, because they don't want to lose the point, or because they don't want to be the goat who lost the point, they try really hard. 
So please make sure that you set up some modified sports in your in your games, in your activity program after the exercise group. Start some exercise, whether it's Tai Chi or um, yoga, gentle stretches, or your regular exercise exercises. Do those first and then start your modified sports because when they fight for a point, they move a lot more. So this will make everybody my <laughs> Tom to squeeze it. When the other aides hear this game going on, they hear this going, they send down more people. So it, it, it just makes people laugh and it's, and it's a lot of, it's something different and it's really fun to do. So I really encourage you to do that. I just like squeezing it. So. Okay, so do that one. Um, the other thing that I'd like to show you guys before we get started with the, with the games that are on the floor is I'd like to show you the tennis. So let me reach over here and get the net. This is a net that I made. You can, you can order them from s and but they'll charge you about $45. And they have nice stands and everything, but I found that buying this material at the fabric store and trimming it off and putting some ties on it works very nicely to tie it in between two dining room chairs. So then I can tie it over there and over here. And now I have a badminton net. I can tie it a little higher or I can keep it down low and I can do volleyball. And when you're doing volleyball, I would encourage you to put a little helium in the balloon or use a large beach ball and again, let a little bit of the air out so that if they only have one hand and they need to scoop it up, they can pinch it and then get it back in, into play. I have seen old ladies, tiny, frail old ladies, play volleyball with me. And in order to get it back over the net, I see them kick their leg like they were rock cats <laughs> because they don't want to be the one that doesn't get the point. And when we play volleyball, I modify it. You can hit it as many times as you want as long as it doesn't touch the ground and get it back over the net. Just, you know, you, you uh, extend the rules, shall we say. You're just going to extend the rules to the game so that people can play and feel successful. The other, the other thing that I will do with this is I will um, make a badminton net out of it. So I tie it up again across. And if you can find them, go to Goodwill and get the wooden rackets. So this is a regular wooden racket. I had the men's group saw this off and sand it for me. That way it wasn't too large, so when I have people playing volley, uh, badminton, I have them a little bit farther apart so they're banging into each other. The reason I'm suggesting this is because these will be durable. I know that many of you probably have gotten the wire hangers and put the nylons on top of it and made brackets out of those, but they don't usually last very long. So I encourage you to get Get all your equipment to look adult-like and real-like and not goofy. Um, the other thing that I would encourage you to do is make sure that you have some modified equipment. Now, what I should do with this is paint this white and red at the bottom so it looks more like an adult birdie. This is a regular birdie, and some of the people can use this. Other people prefer to use a larger birdie. birdie. I got another birdie. Okay, so this makes it very easy then for them to hit it around, and I'm going to hit it over to anybody who can get it, and here it comes. So, okay, let's talk about how we're going to do this. This is in my way when I want to do it, right? So there's no reason why I can't lift this up. And as long as I have good support across the back, now I have a lot more mobility. Same way with throwing the ball. But if you have somebody who has trunk support problems and they may fall over, this is the one time that you can take a gate belt, put it around them, so now that they can move their arm, but they're not going to fall over. So you ready? Here it comes. Easy enough to play. And, oh, I, I don't know. Go ahead, throw it back, see what happens. I missed it. I missed it. I wasn't ready to scoot up. So, but that now gives people the chance to, I can't say really enjoy their wheelchair, but learn how to manipulate their wheelchair so that they are more flexible and independent in their wheelchair. 
And that's always a good thing. You need that. The other thing that I do with my brackets, just to kind of let you know, is every once in a while when I'm playing a game, whether it's a trivia game, or whether it's a game that we're playing and we're working points on, sometimes I will do this. Jay, you got the point. No, you didn't get the point, okay? This makes it very clear where we're at in the volleyball game, okay, when we keep the score. So that's important. Those two things are important. The other thing that I'd like to share with you, if you can ever find one of these, I encourage you to get these magic doodle or etch-a-sketch things because your residents, when they're playing for games for points, you know, they don't really need a prize. They need the praise and they need the recognition. So when we're doing games, I write everybody's name and I give them their points when they get a point. And the reason I'm telling you to get one of these is because you probably have a lot of whiteboards, but OT and PT or the nursing department will come and say, hey, I need a whiteboard for communication in so-and-so's room. And then even if you buy them at the dollar store, they're gone, they're not in your room. Nobody has ever borrowed this. And I don't think they ever will because it's pretty gross looking. But my residents love it, whether we're playing bocce ball, whether we're playing basketball, whatever we're playing, they like to see their name up, they like to see their name with points after. And what does that do that's raising their self-esteem? And then isn't that just as important as the physical movement? Because if we don't have why, they want to do something we'll never get them to do. So, that I would encourage you to do. And so we'll start with the first game that I have on the top. Many of you probably have, let me slide this over here for a minute. Many of you probably have a horse game. And I used to have horse games too, and they were small and they put them on top of the table. Well, if they're small and they put them on top of the table, that doesn't give people very much gross motor skill because they just pretty much watch you move the dice down. So what I do then is I have a large dice and we'll roll the dice out. And when we roll the dice out, we're doing this kind of movement or we're doing this kind of movement. And when somebody throws it to the next person to catch the dice for their turn, they are catching, they're doing the catching thing again. So that's important. And then from the um, physical therapy department, I have stolen these because they borrow so much of my stuff. I feel that I should be allowed to borrow some of their stuff. So I have four different colors, and these are my four different horses. I have at times put different decorations on the top of these, sometimes pumpkin decorations, sometimes just goofy little wigs, sometimes I actually put a little horse thing that we've made that we slide into the top so that they ride the horses down. And they roll out their dice and then we move the dice down. Now sometimes I will let them come up and move their own dice if, they're, if they are safe to reach down and be able to do that. Other times I will move it for them. But just the fact that they are sitting up, they're engaged in the game, and they're moving their arms is forcing their trunk support. So that's why this is a good modified sport. We'll go all the way to the, to the end and back. One time I decided in order to incorporate a little bit more of their cognitive skills, on the way down when we rolled the dice, we were adding the numbers together. On the way back, I asked them to subtract the numbers. And one of my little ladies in the middle of the game as we're coming back, she said, you changed the rules. That's not fair. And I was just amazed that she caught on that I had made the change in the game and they were using now a different skill, which showed her perception. So that was really good too. So I've used this board game and sometimes I have big plastic shoes, any little plastic item. It doesn't always have to be the stuff that I've stolen. Um, but any little plastic thing can be a marker, just like, like you have a regular board game, you have different markers. So that's been really helpful to do that. Game, the next game that I'd like to show you, I'll move this one aside now. Where can you get that board? What? Where can you get that board? This, yeah. Oh, uh, the question was asked, where do I get this board? 
This is not a board. This is one of your tablecloths that you had from a party. Okay. And what I simply did is on it, I put electrician tape. Knowing that these colors are too dense together, the next time I probably would have used white and black, but I was looking for you know bright colors. But sometimes people have a hard time seeing the colors because of their color one. So that might be a chance that you might want to you might want to make that. Okay. The next game that I'm going to show you is um, the next game that I'm going to show you here is Twister, and Twister is pretty easy to play. If you're not playing it the way teenagers and adults play it by getting down on the floor. But what we do is we take the board, and this is what amazes me. Lots of times, too, we're doing gross motor skill, and we forget that these people cannot do fine motor skill. Fine motor skill is moving their fingers or grabbing things. And um, so one of the things that I like to check when I'm doing this is can they do this? Could they play marbles? Could I make a little board with Julia and have them flick and play marbles? And the other thing that this is good for developing your, de your detective skills to find out where they're at, I also want to see, can they tell where, is, where it actually is? Is it on the line? And can they tell me what color it is? This surprised me. I was amazed at how many gentlemen, uh, by the time they're 70 and their 80s, are having colorblind problems. But it also, women are having trouble with vision. So, or the other thing is they may have forgotten the, the name of the color. And that is a good cue for us to realize, okay, they're, they're making more of a progression in their um, dementia diseases. So, whether they flick it like this, or whether they flick it like this, it doesn't matter. I'm going to give them a ball of the same color that they flicked. And I'll grab one of my plastic balls and I will say to them, I will give you a point for every time you can hit the green. So this makes it a lot easier because, uh, excuse me, a lot harder because now they have to negotiate how much farther can I move over here without bumping somebody else. And how can, oh, I only got one out of that. But most of the time I'll get one or two. And then again, I'm going to put it on the board and add it. So that becomes a very fun game to play. You also can use big bags um, to do this one. What I thought was really amazing one time and showed the perception of one of my residents. Her name was Edna. And Edna looked at me, this is a fun game, she said, Connie, but you know what? I bet you I can get them all. And I said, okay, we'll give it a try. So I gave her an extra turn and wouldn't you know, she got the blue one. And she said, I can get them all. And she goes, just like this. And she rolled right down and got six points. That was fair. She got them all. I said, throw the ball. I didn't say how to throw the ball. So there you are. Again, this is another opportunity. Every time we're doing sports where there's a little bit of competition, a little bit of, oh, show me what you can do, or look what I can do, that type of thing, it shows their initiative and remember Alzheimer's people maybe may not be able to express, or people with dementia can't express, express very well. But if they have an idea and they want to do something, they try to figure out the most creative ways to do it. So kind of watch for that and know that that's a, that's a good sign. Okay, let's next move this one out, and we're going to play bocce ball. Excuse me for a minute while I move this to the side. And I'll pick up these balls too. Here. Now you can go to SNS or to one of the other stores again or catalogs that come to you, and you can buy a bunch of ball game. And I'll run you probably about $75. And that's really great, but I found that the stuff that I buy and purchase, sorry to say, that looks really nice, sometimes my staff borrows and takes it home, and they use it, but they from, sometimes forget to bring it back. So one of the cheap solutions to doing bocce ball, and this is very easy, this is just indoor-outdoor carpeting, 
And it's not even the real expensive stuff. It's really kind of cheap. And I think I paid maybe $1.99 per foot, or per square foot. So it was very inexpensive to do. When you play bocce ball, you're supposed to hit the balls in between two pin balls. But when we're doing it in a nursing home or in, uh, in a modified way, I have all the wheelchairs around here. And we have our pin ball in the middle. And we'll put this like right down here in the middle. And then everybody will pick out their ball, and they'll take a turn. And I have several different colored balls. I have a couple balls that, again, as adaptive equipment. This one's a little bit smaller, easier to hold, and it's squeezable so they can grab onto it. So everybody gets their ball. And what makes this, ball, what makes this game fun is that the object of the game is to roll your ball as close as you can to the pin and not touch it. So to your black pin ball there, you're supposed to roll your ball as close as you can and not touch it. What will happen, what makes it very interactive, is I'll roll mine out and I'll be pretty close and then the next person will roll their, theirs out. They got to be really far away. Now let's try for another close one over here. Oh, that person's out. But what sometimes happens is somebody will roll their ball and I'll hit one of the other balls, and I'll either move it farther away and change the, di the dynamics of the game, or I'll move it closer. At this point, I'm going to try to move it closer, so let's see if I can. No, I couldn't do that this time. I have one more chance, so let me see if I can get this one. Oh, I'm such a lousy player. But they have fun because it changes the dynamics. What looks like somebody who's going to win will end up not winning because somebody will hit them a little bit farther away. Very similar to what you do when you're playing croquet. It's sort of like, I don't know if it's skill or if it's revenge, but anyway, they're having fun doing it. So go ahead and know that you, you can do this game. Okay, uh, if there's no questions on this one. So now we're going to do our golf game. And like I said, or if you didn't catch it before, you buy these from Rite Aid. They come uh, with two. Uh, putters, and they come with about three of these with, with the bag on They have the open area. And so I will go around that and put out the greens in a different area. And let me see if I can set this up and get a hole in one or close to a hole in one. Put this down. I'm going to line myself up. So again, I'm working with my wheelchair. And keep my eye on the ball. And I'm going to lean forward. And I have to have the strength, so this is helping me. Again, I would need a restraint if I didn't have the um, trunk support to do it. Oh, I really want to make this. Well, that's one. See if I can get it in there. You didn't see me bump that, did you? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. Oh, I'm such a bad golf player. So you got to watch for that bad sports stuff. But again, we're getting a lot of gross movement out, and so it's important. So you take these around, and then they can go and pick up their ball. The other thing that I like to do with the golf thing, I use these same clubs. But what I will do is I go out into my garden in the middle of the night, and I do not tell my uh, maintenance man what I'm doing. because. What we like to do is get our residents outside as much as possible. And the other thing, your occupational therapists and your PTs will really appreciate the fact if you make a game for them to go over rough terrain. So in other words, pushing their wheelchair through the grass takes a little bit more effort. So I will set up croquet out there, but I will also set up golf. And what I will do is I will eat tuna fish for a long time till I get about six of these. Then I take my wire hangers and I punch holes in these so that now I have a wire hanger up here, I have a little flag on it, and I will dig a hole in the ground. Now what I want you to do, and I'll show up a little video on this, or excuse me, a visual on this later, is take one of the larger soup cans out of the kitchen, dig a hole, punch some holes in the bottom of that soup can, then put that soup can in the hole. 
that will help the water to drain through because being in Oregon here, we get a lot of rain and we don't want that to fill up and have a, a fish pond back there. So we're going to let the water drain out of it. And then I will take my little markers here and I will go and I will put them inside that soup can and now somebody can go from one can to the next green to the next green. And I would usually set up about seven of these. Sometimes there's sidewalks that they have to go over to, to line up to where they're going to tee off. But what happens is now they hit their ball, they can wheel up to where their can is. They've got their ball in there, but they can't get it out. They're going to grab this little hook, take the ball out, put it back down in the hole, put it back down in the hole safely there, and then move on to the next hole. It is really a great game to set out in the middle of summer, or the beginning of summer, so that people have independence to go and do these things. I have found that it's been very important, sometimes for men especially, to, oh, ladies too, but sometimes guys just want to be by themselves and do their own game or go out and practice their own game. And they seem to really enjoy that. If, if I can just give them the equipment, they'll put out the markers and then they'll go around and play their golf course. And even when it's, when it's a lousy day and we've got rain, I will set up this golf course and people will go and hit the balls. Now, sometimes, you know, they can't always get their ball because the ball goes under the piano or whatever. We find it when we move out the piano and clean about 12 years later. But you'll see the ball, so you want to be careful that you go around and pick up the balls. So a lot of the balls, like those balls, they are not heavy balls, so if they accidentally do, you know, give it a good swing and it's flying through the air, hopefully nobody would get hit with it when it's indoors. But they're, they're wiffle. They're wiffle balls. And um, I guess you can also get the um, Nerf type ones that are softer too. But. So that is how we play golf in our building. Um, the last thing today that I want to show you, I think, I may have one more thing after this, but the next thing that I am going to show you is fishing. And so let's pick up our golf course here. And again, I borrowed this from the dining room. I sort of permanently borrowed it because it makes for a very nice fishing pond. So I spread it out here, fishing pond going. Get all the waves out. Now, I have larger ones, and this becomes the marker of the pond, so I can have the guys do it indoors, or if they want to just go in the backyard and practice their fishing or uh, practice or casting, uh, they can do that. And sometimes, I want to be politically correct here, but sometimes guys sort of like to just go in their nothing box, and that's why I think they like fishing. At least that's what I've been told by my husband. Leave me alone, I'm in my nothing box, and I just want to work on this. I'm just going to practice my fly casting. And I've seen him when he first started fly casting do that in the backyard for hours, just hours. So I figured, you know, this might be a good thing for my residents to do. So what I did is I went down to Goodwill, and this is just for, I think, about a buck. I got this rod. It does not have a reel on it. Some of my gentlemen can use a reel, but you will notice here, this again is adaptive equipment because it's not a regular fishing line, but it's a line that people can see. And when, I, when we do the fishing game, I don't use real hooks. What I have on here is a little bit of Velcro. I know that other people have used magnets, but Velcro is a little bit lighter and easier to cast. So before we could actually do this fishing game, we had, we had two sessions where I had the guys teach me, where I had the guys teach me about different fish. And you can buy a fishing game, and again, it's going to cost you quite a bit. But what I had did was I took these outline drawings. They were black and white pictures, clip art. And I blew them up, and I blew them up to probably about 600%. And then we took one afternoon, and they told me, okay, well, this is uh, a bass, and this is a pike, and this might be a smelt. 
And what we did is we took these black and white drawings and we chopped them in and we, we sprayed them so that the um, color would stay on them with a little bit of hairspray will make your, your color stiff. And then after that dried, we went and we laminated them. Many of you probably have laminating machines in your room. So we made a whole bunch of these. And so we throw the fish out. Oh, that's a cheetah fish. It doesn't have a marker on it. Now, I told you about the Velcro on the end of my pole here. Right? You saw the Velcro on the end of the pole? Well, on each of my fish now, there's a little bit of Velcro. Sometimes it's on the head. Sometimes it's down here on the tail. So we'll put that fish out, put that fish out, stop it with that trout, with that big trout in there. I'm going to get a lot of these in here because I don't want to miss. I'm going to catch a fish. Oh, that's a nice colored one. Oh, that's a good, almost tuna like looking one. Oops, I didn't stop it. So let me put the rest of these out there. What I also want you to know is I made this game for the guys to do originally for Father's Day. Because you know on Mother's Day, you always do such a great job of uh, little foo foo things for mom and they have a nice breakfast brunch and family comes. But sometimes for Father's Day, they don't really like a lot of foo foo stuff. They're just so much more practical. And what I found was when I did the fishing game, I would have the guys do a contest. Boy, if I don't catch a fish with all these fish in here, I'm going to be really disappointed in myself. Just walk in there straight those fish up. Now, I do have a couple of fish that don't have markers on them, so they are not catchable, which kind of makes the game a little bit more interesting. And on Father's Day, what we would do then is have a nice breakfast for them and make an omelet just the way that they wanted. And then right after that, we had breakfast, we would have a contest. And each guy would get a turn, and they'd get like five minutes at, at fishing, or less. And whoever caught the biggest fish, whoever caught the smallest fish, or whoever got the, the most fish in their five minutes, they won a, an award. And what, what it would be is a little trophy that I got from, from Goodwill, a little fishing trophy, and they had to keep that in their room for a month until we played the game again. Yeah. Some other times, though, what I will do is on the back of these, I will put prizes. And sometimes it's like a dollar, sometimes it's 10 cents. And I can tell you the smallest fish are the hardest ones to catch, so they may have five bucks on them. And sometimes it would be a coupon for McDonald's, whatever, just make it different and, and fun. So uh, let's see how well I can fish. I'm up to my moment of truth here. And I don't have a whole lot of room behind me, so I'm going to change my angle a little bit here. Right. Of course it's random machine. Oh, I'm gonna have to drag this one across. Maybe not catch something. Oh! Oh, I didn't catch anything. I'm so lucky. Okay, let me loosen my line there. Let's see if I can get it this time. Alright. Oh, I got caught in a bush. Oh, you know what? I don't have enough room. I'm gonna shorten my pole. I really want to get this. I'm going to show you. Hey, I think I got one. Okay, so that's how this game works. The other thing that I'll tell you about this game is once in a while, we had one resident that kept leaving the building because he could see his house from our backyard. So he'd get in his electric wheelchair. And he'd go all the way around, out on the street, and up to the house, knocking the door and asked to come in. Well, this was not really acceptable anymore. And so what we had to do, or what we encouraged Ralph to do, was to go back and he liked fishing. I promised him, and it was to my pleasure to do this, about three times out of the um, summertime, or maybe four, I would take the guys fishing. There are a lot of places around the Portland area that have had cat fishing. So we promised them if he would not leave the premises, because he was independent and, and able to do that, but if he would not go up to his house, his old house, where he could see it from our backyard, 
uh, that I would take him fishing. So he honored that, and then it came to be um, winter time, and we couldn't go fishing, and he was getting restless again. So you know what I did? I made him his very own private fishing game with his own fish, with a much larger pool. He had his rod and spinner on it, and I would let him go when the dining room was empty, go to the dining room, put out his, his pond and his fish, and he literally, he would catch his fish and say, what do you want for dinner tonight? And we would tell him to spot fish. I want that trout right over there in the corner. And you know what? He could cast and hit it almost every time on the first time. He became very, very um, comfortable and happy with that solution of being able to cast and practice casting in the dining room. Then as soon as spring came, we let him go out and garden and do that. And then, of course, we took him again on, on fishing trips. And you would be amazed sometimes if we could provide people the right motivation that we can change their behaviors to the activities that they do. And that was one of the, one, just one example of something that was really, really helpful to change a behavior. So that is pretty much what I have in store for you guys for modified sports. One last thing I want to close with, though, and that is there are things that you can do in your exercise group that you may not be aware of that are safe for your people to do and become very motivating for them. So when you're doing your exercise groups, what I would like you to do, make sure everybody has their break on, make sure you're cleared away their foot pads so those are out of the way. And what I like to do is I like to tell my residents, you know, we can do anything that anybody in the gym is doing here, except for that we're going to do them a little bit differently. And there's two exercises that you can safely incorporate into your uh, sitter size or fit to be fit, sit to be fit exercises. And that is to do sit-ups. What? To do a sit-up? Yeah, to do a sit-up. I've got my brakes on here, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to reach back and I'm going to stretch out. Oh, after being in a wheelchair all afternoon, that feels good. Stretch out, then I tell my residents to bring their hands down to their chest or their stomach, and then I tell them to walk their fingers down. Walk your fingers down to your knees, over your knees, down your knees, and go as far down as you comfortably can, and grab the back of your calves or your ankles, and pull, pull the other way, and stretch out your back from the other side. Now, move your legs back up by moving your fingers up to your knees, back up to your stomach, and stretch out. Now you've done a sit-up. And I get my, my residents to do as many of those as they feel comfortable. And then when their kids come in to find out how mom and dad did for the day, I say, well, your mom did six sit-ups. How many did you do today? My mom did six sit-ups. I said, yes. And then I show her how safely we do the sit-ups and what good movement is. Because very often they're sitting in these wheelchairs and they're crunched over like this. And if we can get them to sit up and throw things and, and play games and go for points, but stretch way back, come forward, stretch down, stretch the other way, grab their ankles safely and push themselves back up, we've got to strengthen their body a great deal. The other thing that I like to do is jumping jacks. What? You're making my mom do jump or my dad do jumping jacks? Yeah, it's really easy in the wheelchair. You're out, you're in, you're out, you're in. But it's very good for the cardio because it has a lot of movement to because they're moving both sides. Or if they've just got one hand or one leg, they're, they're moving at least one side for the exercise. And then again, I brag on them. I say, hey, you did 25 of those. When you first started, you could only do five. And the fact that they're raising their hand up above their arm if they can, or at least out if they can. Now the hardest thing for me to do, because I'm just not that smart, is the reverse ones, where you're in and out, out and in. You reverse it. It's so hard for me to figure out how to do that. But that also is another good game to exercise the brain when we make our brain go into different patterns. So that's all that I have to tell you about modified sports and some modified exercises. Whatever anybody has an interest in doing, I assure you, can, you can adopt the game so that they can do it safely and fun. You should try to do that. Uh, it is required that we have exercise three times a week, but 
almost every body system that you have is going to be improved or helped in some way if we exercise more frequently. And um, I would not say what a time limit is, but safely, whatever they can endure to do. And I would encourage people to come down and do different exercises at least five times a week. If they come and play for five minutes, that's great. They come and play for 10 minutes. It is amazing to me how a person will start in an exercise group, can only throw the ball maybe five feet, and after they come a couple of times or by the next month, they're thrown at 10 feet. Or if I'm sitting in the middle of playing volleyball with them and they're trying to get the ball past me, all of a sudden they are really whacking that ball. And it's just delightful to see them, uh, their confidence build up and their physical endurance build up. So that's what we have to offer in Modified Sports. If you have any other ideas, uh, let me know. And I will put up the sign, but you can uh, email that to Oregon Activity Professionals and Oregon Dementia Practitioners. Give me some ideas, and I will share your best practices with everybody else that goes to that website. So thank you again. Any other questions before we close out? We're good?